Hello and welcome to today's webinar for the month of April. The topic today is Wi-Fi in complex environments. And we're going to be talking about a few use case scenarios. And the real goal of this presentation is not just to talk about those scenarios, but to talk about the things that make Wi-Fi design and deployment complex and how we deal with those various issues. So we're going to be talking about hospitality, warehouses, industrial, outdoor networks, things like this. But the goal is not just to talk about those use cases, but to use them as a tool to bring up some of the common areas where Wi-Fi design can be complex. It's not as simple as it was in the early part of the last decade when you just made sure the signal was everywhere and your job was done. We have greater complexity, greater demands on our wireless lands, and we have to make sure that they're well designed. Now, if you want to tweet during the webinar, you can use the hashtag CWNP webinar. You can also follow CWNP on Twitter at CWNP, and you can follow me at Carpenter Tom. So that information is available for you on an ongoing basis to stay in touch with us. Now, before we get into the topic of today, some CWNP news. First of all, Wi-Fi Trek is still open. You can go to conferences.cwnp.com in order to sign up for the conference in San Diego this year in October. The call for speakers is still open as well, so if you're interested in giving a presentation there, then you can fill out the form at the website conferences.cwnp.com in order to submit that. At this point in time, we have the CWAP and CWDP draft objectives completed. These are what we call the working draft objectives, meaning that we can begin the process of creating learning materials, exam items, and so forth. The objectives may be massaged from this point forward, but they wouldn't change more than less than 1% in most cases. So very little changes are going to happen, and the final objectives will be published later in the summer. So this is coming out of the JTA, the job task analysis that we did back in March. And we have those objectives and we're full steam ahead working on projects to create the learning materials and so forth. Of course, if you don't know, CWAP is the Certified Wireless Analysis Professional and CWDP is the Certified Wireless Design Professional, two of our professional level certifications at CWNP. Now, partial coverage of today's topics can be found in CWS, CWT, and CWNA learning materials, as well as, of course, CWDP learning materials if you want fuller or more in-depth information on these topics. And in case you don't know who I am, by the way, I'm Tom Carpenter. I'm the CTO at CWNP, and you'll find me each month on these webinars. If I'm not the main speaker, I'll still be here to introduce them and so forth. And every week, the Wireless LAN News Desk is posted to the CWNP TV channel on YouTube so we can try to keep you informed and maybe even educate you a bit on a weekly basis. So with that, let's talk about the agenda of this webinar. The first thing, what makes an environment complex? Why would one environment be complex when another one is not? Uh, or more specifically, what are the things that make any environment complex? Then we'll talk specifically about warehouses, industrial, hospitality, and outdoor networks to get an understanding for them. Now, I'm separating warehouses and industrial because warehouses have some pretty consistent things that they bring to the table across the board. And then industrial can sometimes include warehouses in many discussions, but I'm looking at it here as the manufacturing environment. So the process where products are made and produced. So We'll look at those as two separate things, but if you want to combine them together in your mind, that's fine too. Then we'll talk about hospitality, we're talking about hotels, conference facilities, things like that, and then outdoor networks. I'll give you some design tips and recommendations, and of course, we've already talked about the related CWNP certifications. So let's jump right in. What makes for a complex environment? Well, I would say there are three things that can drive complexity. First, there is the set of requirements related to the wireless LAN that you're designing or deploying. Then there are the materials within the facility and then the equipment that is used within that space. So let's talk about requirements. How do requirements impact complexity? Well, if you have high density versus standard density, if we can get by with calling it standard density, then you have very different requirements. But it's important to know that even within standard density, requirements still have an impact. We'll talk about that with the next two bullet points. So with high density, obviously, we need to accommodate many more devices in the same amount of space 
than we would with standard density. So this word density is all about what is the level of devices and network use that is expected within, if you will, a square footage space, a specifically defined area. So some areas are going to be what we might call standard density. They're the common Wi-Fi deployments. Some will be high density and some will be very high density. And then you might even want to come up with more levels. You might have low density, standard density, medium density, high density, and very high density. I'm not really concerned with how many levels you specify, but to understand here that the level of density increases the complexity as the level of density increases, because now, particularly in 2.4 gigahertz, you have to deal with a lot more co-channel interference and balance that out with the number of APs that you're deploying. But in very high density, it's still true in 5 gigahertz that you have to balance out co-channel interference with the number of APs you're deploying. You have to use strategic methods to deploy the many more APs that you need to deploy, such as lower output power from the APs and so forth. So more decisions have to be made and that introduces more complexity. But regardless of the density level, you always have to consider the devices and applications that are going to be used on that wireless network. So for example, with applications, if you're not using any voice over IP handsets that are Wi-Fi, and you're not using any other real-time streaming type applications, then you can design a wireless network that's quite different than one that you would design for real-time applications. For example, with real-time applications, very fast roaming becomes more important than it does with non-real-time applications. Though roaming is still important with non-real-time applications, you can handle longer roam times. And by roaming, I mean, of course, your client is moving from one AP to another, but we don't want to do layer three roaming, so we're keeping our IP address. We're roaming at the Wi-Fi level, layer one and layer two of the OSI model. Now, devices also have a very significant impact. There are all kinds of devices that might be in a space, particularly when you go into an existing building that has existing older Wi-Fi and also older devices that they may want to keep on using. So, for example, someone may have purchased seven or eight years ago Wi-Fi door locks for the entire facility. And these would be door locks that have a Wi-Fi chipset in them, talk through the AP to some central accounting application, and they don't send a lot of data, but guess what they tended to be seven or eight years ago? 802.11g. And so that was all they supported. And some of them only support WPA. They don't support WPA2. And so you've got this issue of an old device that's literally physically in your doors. The expense of replacing them is quite large. And it does introduce issues as you move forward. So that's kind of a, one of the worst case scenarios, but we also have other devices that we just have large CapEx investments in, such as 2000 barcode scanners in an extremely large organization with lots of warehouse space. In that kind of scenario, do you want to go out and spend the money that's going to be required to replace all those barcode scanners with the latest and greatest Wi-Fi? You may not. And that can be an issue. So those devices might be there. And the organization may say one of the constraints, you have to continue to support these barcode scanners that we've been using now for 11 years. We don't want to change them because they all work perfectly fine, but we want the newer Wi-Fi for this other stuff that we're getting ready to do. All of a sudden, you've got complexity. Then you have the materials of the building itself. So here we're talking about wall materials, floor and ceiling materials, if it's a multi-floor facility. We're talking about the things that are in the facility. So, for example, RF is going to propagate through an office space that has, let's say, office panels that partition office space in an otherwise open area. It's going to propagate in that space very differently than it would in a building where each office has actual walls that go ceiling to floor and each office is separated from every other office. So that's going to impact things. So your internal walls, and then you've got things like rows of filing cabinets and in industrial, you've got machinery and so forth. So there are all kinds of different things that can impact it from a materials perspective. So don't confuse this with equipment. I'm not looking at it in, in this context as to the actual RF energy that equipment might 
generate. I'm talking about the materials that the equipment is are made of. Those materials cause reflection, absorption, etc., and impact the way RF propagates. So then we've got equipment, and now I am talking about RF radiation. So we have really two kinds of RF radiation that come off of equipment, intentional and unintentional, which is also sometimes called incidental. And so the intentional equipment, it is RF. It has a radio in it. It's intended to radiate a signal for some purpose. It's, it's outputting some kind of data using a signal, right? So this is RF equipment. It might be Wi-Fi. It might be non-Wi-Fi, but working in the same frequency space. And so we have to find that stuff and account for it. And that adds complexity to the deployment. Then we have things that can generate RF energy, but that's not why they're designed. A motor, for example, is not designed to generate RF energy, but it incidentally does. And so some motors will generate RF energy and it might be significant in some cases. Other types of devices can generate RF energy, but it's not what they're designed for. However, they still do, and it needs to be considered, and it adds to the complexity of the environment. So these are some of the major factors, then, that determine how complex a wireless LAN design is going to be. High density versus standard density and other levels of density, the applications and devices, the actual building materials, and then either intentional or unintentional RF that might be in existence within that facility. So with that said, let's take a look at some use cases and see how some of these things apply. So if we're looking at a warehouse, we're going to talk about challenges and solutions as we go through these. So the first thing about a warehouse that is a challenge is inventory. Now, why is that a challenge? Not because it's there. If it was there and it was always there, then we could just design understanding the propagation in the space based on the absorption of the RF energy by these materials or the reflection and then move on with our lives. But what happens when the inventory is not there? What happens when many of the shelves are empty? Uh, you, if you have a warehouse for distribution or something, you probably hope to move that stuff out of the warehouse. You want to sell it, right? It needs to move. You don't want it to stay there the whole time. And so it can have different levels of inventory. Now, some, the levels vary only by 15 or 20 percent because as quickly as something goes out, something else comes in. But others may vary by 50 to 80 percent or more. And there may be times when the warehouse is almost completely empty and times when it's almost completely full. There's no question then that impacts RF propagation and it impacts things like co-channel interference. Right, So CCI, for those that might not be fully informed, co-channel interference or CCI, is that which occurs when you have multiple BSSs on the same channel and stations within those BBS, BSSs, BBSs, I'm going back to the 90s, uh, stations within those BSSs, whether they're the APs or the clients, can actually hear the communications on the other channel, the other BSSs significantly enough that they have to defer to them. So for example, if I hear a transmission on my channel, let's say I'm on channel six to keep it simple. I hear a transmission on channel six. It's not part of my BSS, but I'm hearing it at say neg 83 or neg 84 dBm. Guess what? I've got to sit there and be quiet. I can't talk. I have to defer to that communication that's taking place. Well, if I design my wireless network using omnidirectional antennas in a warehouse space, for example, and then the shelving is empty, guess what's probably going to increase? Well, I'm probably going to get more CCI, particularly in 2.4 gigahertz. So that's something that I've got to think about. Fluctuations in inventory levels impact the performance of my wireless network. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, we also have reflective materials. So the shelving itself may be reflected. Some shelving is when there's nothing on the shelves, it's completely empty space all the way through. Other shelving has either a, a, a narrow mesh or a, a thin, complete metal backing. So the back of the shelves is metal to keep things from sliding from one side of the aisle over into the other side for the other aisle. And so they've got these backings there in some cases. With those backings, you've got these 
huge reflectors, right? Uh, think about, for example, a parabolic dish, right? So the thing that helps push that energy in one direction or receive energy coming into it is that big back panel that acts as a reflector pulling the energy into the antenna or pushing the energy out. Uh, and guess what? It's not just the solid ones. What else works? You know, you've heard of grid antennas, right? They still work. Why? Because if the, the, the mesh grid is small enough, the RF waves are still reflected. And so the point is that reflective materials like those backings can impact it. The ceiling is often metal. It's reflective. The walls are often bare metal with nothing covering them. All of these things can cause reflections. And that's going to impact the propagation in a significant way, particularly when the inventory is emptier. And then you have high ceilings. So you've got 20 foot, 25, 30, or even higher ceilings. Uh, so if we want to put that in meters, you know, you've got possibly 12 to even 20 meter ceilings. So the point is that with these very high ceilings, it's not as simple then as it would be in a typical office of, hey, I've got these great omnidirectional uh, APs with internal antennas, and I'm just going to mount them up on the cross beams and allow them to do their normal omni work. Well, if they do their normal omni work, they're probably not designed with patterns that are designed to be mounted 30 feet above or 20 feet even above the area that you actually want coverage. Now, sure, you, you get on your rising lift and you go up to the top shelf, your barcode scanner is going to work great. But you get down to the bottom shelf, you may not have significant signal. And that's particularly true when the shelving is full, because where you might get coverage below an AP from some other AP, that's further away from you on the ceiling. And so it has propagated down enough, right, from the omni propagation pattern. We've got a vertical and a horizontal beam width, and that vertical beam width is slowly going down. So you might have had coverage. Problem is, your shelves are full, so you don't. So we've got to think of solutions for that. So these are challenges. Solutions then, uh, survey with and without inventory if possible. Uh, you can't always do that. Sometimes you're deploying in an existing warehouse that's full of inventory. That's what you're going to have. Or it's just empty, and that's what you're going to have. And so we can deal with that some with the right choice of antennas. So it's often chosen to use antennas that are going to aim down hallways and they're wall mounted rather than ceiling mounting them. Or they're ceiling mounted, but we use antennas that are uh, kind of like a cone coming down to provide the coverage. Uh, the big thing, it, it too, in these highly reflective environments is no Wi-Fi. Uh, so, for example, in a very highly reflective environment, this thing we call the short guard interval could potentially cause problems for you and cause symbols to step on each other in the communications processing and result in corruption. I don't have time today to get into all of the details of what a symbol is and every detail about the short guard interval. But if you don't know about it, look at our CWNA materials, look at CWDP materials, um, and you'll understand the short guard interval is a uh, an interval that is half the time as the previous interval, which we sometimes now call the long guard interval, that's between individual symbols. Uh, to simplify it, think of it like a wave, individual waves that are sending data. OK, so there's a space between them so that if reflections occurring and one's arriving sooner, they're not corrupting and stepping on each other. One wave stepping on the next and so on, or one symbol stepping on the next. So we can disable the short guard interval in order to assist with that in a highly reflective environment. How do you know? Well, if you're having a lot of retries, very high retry rates, try disabling the short guard interval. Did your retry rate go way down? then you know you're in that reflective environment that can't handle 400 nanoseconds instead of 800 nanoseconds. If you disable the short guard interval and your retry problem is not solved, then you probably want to re-enable the short guard interval because the reality is it didn't solve the problem, which means it probably wasn't the cause of the problem. Okay. And then, of course, it comes down to proper design. And we're going to see that as we go along. Uh, proper design is absolutely essential for any environment. We'll see that more. So what about industrial? Um, with industrial, the challenges are the machinery. So I've got an image here for you just showing you a, a, an example of an industrial environment, manufacturing process, what have you. And look at these large pieces of equipment with metal enclosures. And we know big pieces of metal can be reflectors, right? So we've got these pieces of equipment in there, which are going to cause some interesting propagation patterns. Um, but in addition to that, they may be generating 
incidental or unintentional RF energy. And so that's something that has to be considered. Then you've got your non 802.11 RF. So in an environment like this, it's not uncommon to have different types of devices that are used for different purposes that are RF based, but they're not 802.11. And those devices, they don't care about 802.11. They don't play by the channel access rules that 802.11 devices play by. They may not even listen for RF energy before they start to talk. They may just start talking. And so they can step right on an existing 802.11 communication. And then, of course, you have unique clients uh, that have different capabilities. You might still have some old, <laughs> old 11B barcode scanners that are in use in some of these spaces that you go into. And so that's obviously something to deal with. So what are the solutions here? Well, we've got spec and surveys and spec and surveys. So the, the spec and surveys are about finding out about that unintentional energy that might be generated by equipment. You can go through and find that. And they're also about finding non 802.11 RF devices. So that's why we want to go through with a spec analyzer and find out what's in there. We're always going to use a spec an, uh, even in a corporate type deployment. We still want to use a spec an. We want to go through and find non 802.11 RF devices. And you might find some unusual, unintentional radiator there too. So that's still needed, um, but it's an even higher demand in a space like what we see here. And then know the capabilities of those unique clients. Are they 11G? Okay, if they're 11G, can they do WPA2 or can they only do WPA? These are factors that you have to consider because it's going to impact the performance of your network. Uh, to make a long story short, if you have to implement an SSID that supports WPA because you want to keep some old 11G barcode scanners or some other device that is not WPA2 capable, then um, realize that you're only going to want those devices on that BSS. And the reason, it, or other devices like them that require WPA. And the reason is that when you enable WPA instead of WPA2, technically in the standard, when you enable WPA, you're enabling TKIP RC4 instead of WPA, which would be CCMP AES. So when you're implementing WPA or TKIP RC4, you are also saying that no device in that BSS should communicate above 54 megabits per second. I don't have the time to go into all the details for why that is, but let's just say the 802.11 standard sets that rule. And so it is basically saying that you can't use the 802.11n or 802.11ac physical layers. You have to use 802.11a or 802.11g or earlier physical layers. And so for that reason, you don't want to use WPA unless you absolutely have to. And the ideal thing is for security reasons, obviously, I mean, we've got concerns with WPA too today if they're not patched and updated. So if you're using WPA, uh, there needs to be a plan to move away from it sometime in the very near future. And then we have hospitality. Now, when it comes to hospitality, there are a lot of interesting challenges that are there that you might not think of if you've never worked in one of these spaces. Obviously, we have the facilities um, and you know, I like to look at hospitality like really three facilities in one in many cases. And what I mean by that is you have a residential space. It's kind of like an apartment complex, right? It's a residential space. Then you have a conference space. And then you have various types of open spaces and public access areas. It could be anything from the pool to the, the, the lobby to the restaurants, to the exercise room, et cetera, right? So you've got all of these. So there are really th at least three different general categories of spaces in most larger hotels or hospitality spaces today. So we have to think about that because they're going to have different requirements in those spaces. In a hotel room, you probably need to support anywhere from three to 10 devices in that hotel room, unless someone's there with all their kids and all of their devices. <laughs> So in a hotel room, not as many devices per hotel room. But then again, your design might be that one AP is covering five, six, seven hotel rooms. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, in the conference space, you may have one conference room that needs to support two, three, four hundred, five hundred, a thousand devices. It just depends on how large the attached conference facility is, right? Some hotels have two or three meeting rooms. Some hotels have 20 or 30 with banquet halls that can support uh, five, 10,000 people. And so there's going to be a lot of variance there. And those conference and convention center facilities are going to tend to require 
greater density deployments than what we do within the residential space or even the open public spaces. And capacity then is a big problem that we have to think about in these spaces, both from the perspective of those convention centers I talked about, but also even in the residential spaces. Because in those residential spaces, you need to make sure you can handle the load. And that means capacity from a Wi-Fi perspective, but the third bullet point, the backhaul, is important too. So what do I mean by that? Well, when we're dealing with the backhaul, you've got to make sure that you have a link to the internet that is fast enough to provide effective throughput for your customers, your residents at the hotel, your attendees of the conference facilities and so forth. The, the big issue here, I see this all the time. People will complain about Wi-Fi at a hotel and sometimes the complaint is justified. That is, they've actually pulled up a tool like Wi-Fi Explorer Pro or some other tool like this, and they've looked around the space and they can see the APs that are deployed and they can see it's not well designed. But more often than not, it's just someone that fired up their laptop and did a speed test with something like speedtest.net. And they say, man, the Wi-Fi at this hotel is horrible. Is it? Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. It's going to get the blame because that's what the user thinks of as everything. So, you know, if they say, hey, I have Wi-Fi at home, what they mean is they have internet through their cable provider, their DSL provider, satellite backhaul, whatever it is, they have internet through their ISP, which is not wireless in most of the cases. And then they have the ISP's wireless router and that provides their Wi-Fi. So, but they're saying they have Wi-Fi. What they actually mean in most cases is they have wireless internet, but their internet pipe is almost always their bottleneck. So for example, if they've got a, an 802.11n wireless router and they say, man, I'm sitting in my living room and I'm only getting 20 megabits per second. Well, it's not the Wi-Fi that's probably doing that. In most cases, it could be, but in most cases, it's that you're paying for 20 megabits per second of internet bandwidth, uh, or you're paying for 50 and only getting 20. But the point is, it's about the backhaul. And it's very true in the hotels as well. So we have to accommodate to make sure the Wi-Fi works very well. And from the user's perspective, that means the internet works very well, as well as the Wi-Fi. So we've got to design the capacity of the Wi-Fi and have a backhaul that can handle the capacity demands. So what are the solutions? I told you proper design would come up again. Here we are. Proper design, proper design, proper design. We'll get into a little bit more of what that means as we go along. Um, outdoor networks. Let's talk about these briefly and then we'll get into some various tips and tricks and talk about some other things. So the challenges. There are seasonal changes. Uh, for example, this isn't exactly densely uh, populated with foliage producing items. Um, we do see some smaller bushes along the left in this shot. We see trees with leaves on them and so forth. Uh, but environmental changes and se seasonal changes rather do impact things in areas of the world where the leaves fall off and then they come back on and so on. If you have lots of lower trees, there can be significant changes in the RF coverage in that space. Um, large trees can result in uh, a brief area of shadow behind them where there's not much signal right behind the tree if there's just one AP throwing RF at it because there's not something just past the tree to reflect the signals back to that dark side of the tree, if you will. Then there are environmental changes in outdoor spaces. So think about things like loading docks and, and so forth where one day you have 15 semi-trailers parked at the loading dock and the next day you have one. It's going to be very different then uh, in relation to how that coverage works. And then attenuation is different outdoors. Free space, the energy stays stronger longer, right? Because there's not a wall for it to pass through to attenuate that RF signal. So we want to make sure that we're not causing major problems for surrounding buildings that might have Wi-Fi and so forth, um, but that we are getting the coverage that we also need in these outdoor spaces. So the solutions, well, if we design for the dense seasons, then when the foliage is down, the Wi-Fi should still work. And 2.4 gigahertz uh, CCI may increase, yeah, a little bit, but the Wi-Fi is going to work in the dense seasons and in the not-so-dense seasons, you know, winter and fall, 
then CCI may go up and we have to accommodate for that and make sure performance is still acceptable at that point in time. So I'm talking about outdoor access networks in this case where lots of people are going to use them. So think about a park like this or outdoor concert facilities, these types of things. No potential changes. So are there trucks coming and going and so on that can change that outdoor environment? No free space propagation. Understand just how far that signal's going to go and the impact of CCI then in these outdoor spaces. And then use the right antennas. So you can be creative with directional antennas and reduce CCI and also accomplish coverage that you need within the outdoor space. So let's talk about some of these things. So I've mentioned a couple of times using different antennas. So using different antennas outdoors, using different antennas to shoot down hallways uh, in uh, or aisles rather within warehouses. So I just wanted to show you a few examples of images. These are generated out of Ivy Wave Wi-Fi. And what we're seeing here are 3D representations of the basic azimuth and elevation charts. So if you're familiar with those antenna charts, what they do in this tool is they give you a 3D view. And I can't rotate them here. This is a slide, but you can rotate them and see how they work. So we see a patch antenna and you see the directionality of it there. I said antenna, a patch antenna, and you see the directionality of it there. We have an omni antenna in the middle, and if we were to rotate that, you'd see that traditional sort of kind of donut shape that we see if we're looking at the vertical uh, chart, the elevation chart. But here we're looking at the horizontal or azimuth chart. And then you see an internal AP. This is actually a MIMO three stream AP. And now that I've said that, you can probably see why it has the shape it has, right? Each one of those antennas is an omnidirectional antenna in this case, as best as it can be designed in those very tiny enclosures. <laughs> and so we end up with this kind of cloverleaf pattern. It's an interesting thing that you can see when you look at something like a 3D view of the pattern. So that obviously does tell you that you're not going to get a circular pattern out of this particular AP. And I forget exactly which one this was that I modeled. But the point is that different antennas have different propagation patterns. So you've got to pick the right antenna. And then there's environmental impact on radiation. So I put this little graphic together using a site survey and, and predictive modeling or design tool to help you see some of the things that impact this. So simplified view. Now, the Wi-Fi access point is where it says Wi-Fi on the right of the thick wall going up and down in our graphic here. And then it's the antenna that's on the left side of that thick wall. So there's a, apparently a cable run to the antenna. So you'll see the strongest signal right around the antenna is, is, uh, as it's a red shade and then it changes to an orange and then a yellow and then a green and then eventually a blue. So blue being the darker blue being the weaker signal strength. So what I want you to notice is the instant impact of the thick wall. Look at that very quick attenuation to the right of the antenna as opposed to that which is to the left and downward. So that obviously impacts things. It's not a circle as far as uh, or, or the omnidirectional antenna here as far as all directions because one direction had a thick wall right beside of the AP which attenuated that signal much more quickly, right? And so it changes the way it radiates. So we can look at the radiation patterns, but the environment's going to change the real radiation that we get. And that's why these great modern survey tools are so important to our practices. There are many of them out there. You know, you've got uh, survey, Air Magnet Survey Pro, Echo House Survey, Tamograph. Uh, you've got uh, IB Wave Wi-Fi. There, and there are vendor tools that are built into their controllers and software that allow you to do this kind of modeling. So it's just so important to have a tool like this to be able to see the impact of a real floor plan with real walls modeled and materials. Notice the thin wall further down. You see there's attenuation. It's not as significant as the thick wall, even out at that further distance. I do want you to see the interesting effect of the filing cabinets. Now, I cheated here. These aren't really filing cabinets. I put a metal wall there, a wall made of metal, and I made it four feet tall. Okay, so that's what that actually is in this model here for us to see it. But look at what happens. Notice that beam that kind of goes down and to the right of the filing cabinet. You can see it even going across the thick wall, going into the blue space. You can see that beam going across there. Okay, that's very important to see the reflection caused 
by these filing cabinets. And interestingly enough, that reflection actually increased the signal a little bit below the thin wall and to the right of the thick wall as the signal reflected back into that space. But look behind them. Look at how we instantly go to the weakest signal strength uh, represented by the color gradients here because of this phenomenon called RF shadow. So the metal's not really allowing hardly any at all of the RF to go through it, if any, and it's going around it and it does come back together, but it doesn't come back together immediately. So we get this kind of dead spot on the other side. And of course, things like elevator shafts and so forth can cause this within spaces as well. So it is important to keep in mind if there was something else reflective, maybe up above this filing cabinet or below it, then it might have reflections indoor to get to that back area that's not covered right now. But it was something when it's something large like an elevator shaft and the APs on one side of it and not the other, it's not uncommon on the other side of that elevator shaft to not have the signal that you want to have. So this is just to illustrate and help you kind of see the impact of RF propagation. Now here we see uh, another example just to illustrate this. So here what we have is a, a simple modeled space with multiple aisles of storage in a warehouse. On the right side in the top part where you see these little rectangles with little squares inside of them and then all of a sudden it's this blue and it just goes extremely weak extremely quick. That is storage containers that have been brought in that are very dense with absorptive materials inside of them. And so obviously, as you can see to the right of them, they have all but destroyed the signal there. We see this a similar effect in the lower right with the smaller square storage containers. Uh, you can see that down the aisle directly by this AP, which by the way, just has an omnidirectional antenna on it. You can see down that middle aisle, everything's great. We've got good coverage all the way across. You can get to the other end of the aisle and you're still at around neg 63 or 4 dBm. You even get all the way to the wall, far wall, and you're at around neg 66 or 7. You've got good signal. But look at the top and the bottom corners. Your signal's very poor. Even look at just the top and bottom middle. And you can see we're somewhere neg 73 to neg 78 or 9 dBm. And if you look at the uh, top and bottom from the whole right third, all of a sudden we're down in those neg 80s, neg 90s. Not a really good space to be. So what this tells you is I couldn't design this network with one AP and an omnidirectional antenna like this. I'm not going to accomplish what I need. I would be better off with multiple APs with omnidirectional antennas or with APs with directional antennas that are aiming down these aisles. So these are things that you have to consider. So remember the coverage factors, radiation pattern, the antenna radiation pattern, the output power, and then the RF behaviors in the environment. These are the things that are going to determine and they're the things you can tweak and the things you can work with. You can change antennas, you can change output power, you can understand the RF behaviors in the environment. You can't really change them in most cases, but you can understand them. You can change the location of the antenna in uh, relation to the RF behaviors. So these are the three things that impact our decisions in these scenarios. Here we have outdoor coverage, and I've already talked about it some, but I just kind of modeled this to let you see that, yes, trees cause attenuation. So, you know, people don't often think about this in outdoor spaces, but if there are large trees, so for example, you know, let's say for some reason you want Wi-Fi coverage in Armstrong National Forest, uh, probably not too worried about it. But let's say you were, you get these giant redwoods, right? Some of them 14, 16 feet wide. Believe me, they cause attenuation. And in addition to that, your little two to four foot wide trees cause attenuation. And we see that here as the RF signal is propagated from this AP that's sort of in the middle on channel 11, channel 52. And you can see the shadow areas right behind the tree. It does come back together again, but we've got these shadow areas. So obviously trees cause attenuation. Hey, they're wood, right? If you have a wood wall in a building that you're modeling, it causes attenuation. Trees do the same, but because they're smaller, the RF usually comes back together and you might have some weaker spots behind them, but eventually Wi-Fi signal will work again. But this can be considered if you want coverage in all those areas, you're probably going to have to have different APs at different locations to accommodate for these types of factors. And then outdoor in coverage areas, you do want to think about roaming. And this is mostly an issue on campus areas 
So you've got some kind of a campus space and yes, you need coverage in the building, but you may need coverage outside as well. So if someone's on a voice over IP, a voice over IP handset and they go from building A to building B, they don't want to lose their call while they're walking between these buildings. And then you've got coverage and capacity issues. So keep in mind that it's important to define the different requirement areas within your space. So, for example, looking at the space we have here, we have the large meeting room in the upper right. Notice we're calling it a capacity zone. Uh, it's NEG 65 dBm is what we need, up to 70 devices, 320 kilobits per device. Okay, well, that's nice because we have another capacity zone. It also needs NEG 65 dBm, but it's only going to be up to 40 devices and 320 kilobits per device. So they're two different things. They're both capacity zones, but their requirements are not exactly the same. So I like the term requirement area because it allows me to say in this large meeting room, what are all of my requirements? And it might be more than just capacity. And then you'll notice I've got just a desired coverage area that is NEG 75 in the lower right. That's good enough for that. It's the break room. I don't really want people hanging out in there. <laughs> and then all the gray area is just coverage at NEG 65 dBm. That's the goal I've set, right? So the point is that I've set my specification for what I desire to have in this space. And that is a key to designing any good wireless LAN, regardless if you want to call it complex or not. Have metrics that define your coverage. Don't just say, I need coverage. What coverage do you need? And then in addition to that, define your requirement areas so that you've got your capacity specified, your security requirements specified, and so forth. Now let's talk about two more slides and then we'll uh, end the scheduled part of the presentation. So common problems in all wireless lines, coverage holes. So when you're in these complex environments, it's really easy to have those spaces where that RF shadow exists, where you just don't have the coverage that you need. So you've got to make sure your plan accommodates for that. Your design must. Uh, connection failures are one of the most common problems. Why are they failing to connect? Is it because their authentication is not set up right. Is it because they don't actually have a good enough signal to connect? Is it because of interference from a non-Wi-Fi device, etc.? Connection failures are common problems. We need to make sure our design is designing a good network that people can actually connect to. That's probably our end goal. Uh, IP addressing problems. Make sure there's sufficient IP addresses. Slow transfers. So this is a sign that either we don't have the capacity design done well on the Wi-Fi side, or we just don't have the wired side done well, whether it's an internet pipe or communications internally. A uh, slow or no roaming. So no roaming would indicate that I'm moving from one AP to another, but I'm losing my IP address. So what I'm really doing is completely disconnecting and reconnecting to the network. I'm not really roaming like I need to in a wireless network at layer two for layer two roaming. I'm instead doing layer three roaming, which you might as well call a disconnect and a reconnect because I'm getting a new IP address. Um, obviously, that is about having the overlap that we need for our different BSS cells called a basic service area in the standard so that I can roam from one to the other and that I have the infrastructure in place to allow for roaming. Excessive roaming. Uh, this can be caused because I've got a lot of APs and everywhere I am, I've got two or three APs within a few dBm of signal strength of each other and or within a few db signal strength of each other rather and so that can cause kind of flip roaming where i'm flipping back and forth and that comes down to a design issue and i need to make sure that i have the right number of ap's providing the right signal strength coverage to try to work with my clients as best as i can but remember that's a client decision for roaming today and so i can't control everything that happens there uh, and then of course interference is a common problem in wireless networks which should have been addressed if it was pre-existing in the survey stage when I do my spec and survey and I look through that environment and see what's already there. Now, design tips and recommendations. Here's the thing that we need to think about. We need to ensure you use good design methods. So design shouldn't be something you do haphazardly. Have a method, a process that you flow through. Uh, within CWDP, as we're developing it now, we're focusing on defining the requirements, designing the network, deploying the network, and then validating and optimizing that network. This is kind of the flow. I'm not saying there's no overlap. So you might, during the design phase, 
need to go back and define more things because someone tells you while you're designing the wireless network, oh, we want this too. So yeah, you're still kind of defining when you find that out. Uh, but they're very specific tasks that need to happen in relation to requirements definition, in relation to design, in relation to deployment and so forth. Make sure you define your metrics. So when you're defining what people want, uh, don't, don't accept, um, we just need coverage everywhere in the building because that's not true for hardly any deployment today. Instead, it's a different kind of coverage in different areas of the building. So it's up to me then to dig deeper and ask what devices and applications are used in these different areas. Uh, how many devices are going to be used? How do those applications work? Now, they might not have the answers, but if I can get the lists of devices and applications, I can get the answers and I can find that information out, right? So I need to get all that and I need to define the right metric. Is it NAG65, NAG67, NAG69? What is the signal strength that I need everywhere? What is the capacity that the network has to handle? So I define them. And then in my validate and optimize phase, I validate that I've accomplished it and optimize where I need to, to resolve issues. So make sure you're designing for both coverage and capacity in these kinds of environments and any environment for that matter.